cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide Buddy, he's your Peptide Buddy. Hey everybody, although it sounds like it could be a GLP-1 agonist like semaglutide or terzepatide, that's not the case for cagrillantide. And I imagine it's a popular misconception since some claim it could burn fat off you better than an 80s aerobic dance workout. And I think it may also be conflated with GLP-1 since there's a combo medication of semaglutide and cagrillantide by Novo Nordisk called Cagrisema that's currently in development. But before we dive headfirst into the world of peptides and fat loss, I do want to say thank you for all the support you fellow peptide pioneers have given me. We've recently reached 10k subs here on the channel, a dream I'd never thought was a reality. And so I want to give a shout out to all of you. And by the way, if you haven't already, just hit that like and subscribe button for more unbiased, research-driven peptide content. Thank you all. Now, we've already mentioned two ways cagrillantide could be mistaken for a GLP-1 agonist the name, the focus on fat loss, and now I'll give you a third, how it works. Just like GLP-1 agonists lead to increased insulin secretion, decreased glucagon release, delayed gastric emptying, and subsequently decreased appetite, the way cagrillantide works isn't too different. It's not identical, but it's not in a separate universe. But it is, as you'll see, quite unique. What's interesting is that this peptide isn't a direct agonist of glucagon-like peptide 1 receptors, like the semaglutides of the world. Instead, it's known as a long-acting amylin analog. And unlike other compounds we frequently dissect, this is a newer compound, a peptide of the 2020s, if you will. Now, the role of amylin in human metabolic physiology is multifaceted. It's co-secreted alongside insulin in response to food consumption from the beta cells of the pancreas. So in these postprandial states, after eating, it helps to stabilize blood sugar by decreasing release of glucagon and delaying gastric emptying. It's also responsible for central signals of satiety through binding receptors in the brain, most predominantly the area postrema of the hindbrain, and it mediates some of its central effects by potentiating or heightening the effects of leptin, a hormone that essentially tells the brain to engage in catabolic processes, things like decreased appetite, increased energy expenditure, even decreased interest or pleasure in eating. That's why some people who say they take this compound report they just have no interest in eating food or the same pleasure that they would have otherwise because of these central nervous system mediated effects. And kind of like how we saw with the proposed effects of ritatratide, amylin, albeit in a different way, itself is thought to promote a negative energy balance in reference to more of a metabolically catabolic or energy efficient state. Hence, there was some time ago development of an injectable drug called pramlintide used in diabetics to stabilize blood sugar. But it's a subcutaneous injection given three times per day because of its short half-life, which sounds not ideal. Not the worst, but if you're prone to develop some gastrointestinal side effects in addition to performing multiple daily injections for some improved metabolic parameters and mild weight loss, maybe a few kilos over a year if you're lucky, likely more in folks who maximize lifestyle interventions, there are, especially nowadays, better, more popular pharmacologic options. And so clearly, there was room to develop a drug that may act similarly, but without the need for multiple daily injections. So that's what takes us to the modern day, where we have cagrillantide's current standing in research and development, a compound whose half-life is not 20 to 45 minutes, but rather between 6.5 to 8 days. And in rats, the more cagrillantide you give them, the more their appetite appears to diminish. Now into the clinical trials, the fun part. Let's jump to a phase 2 trial where researchers looked at different doses of cagrillantide versus either liraglutide, a GLP-1 agonist, or placebo in people without diabetes who are either obese or overweight with hypertension or dyslipidemia. The most prominent results in terms of body weight lost appeared to come from the two greatest doses of cagrillantide, followed by liraglutide. However, only the top dose, 4.5 milligrams of cagrillantide weekly, was statistically superior to liraglutide 3.0 milligrams. Weight reduction was greatest in this cagrillantide group at about 10.8% over half a year. 
We can summarize in a nutshell that cagrelantide produced clinically meaningful dose-dependent weight loss superior to placebo and to liraglutide 3 mg. With a tolerable safety profile dominated by mild gastrointestinal symptoms, especially nausea. Enter Cagrisema. Now, since Novo's moneymaker with Cagrilantide appears to be in the combo drug space, as we hinted at earlier, the clinical atmosphere is starting to look at Cagrisema versus Cagrilantide alone versus Semaglutide alone. And thus, it was looked at in a trial where participants were overweight subjects on metformin who suffer from type 2 diabetes. And over 32 weeks, the most prominent reduction in HbA1c was from the Cagrisema group, though only statistically superior to Cagrilantide, and the greatest reduction in body weight too was present with the combination drug, about 15.6% in the Cagrisema group versus 8.1% in the Cagrilantide group and 5.1% in the semaglutide group. Gastrointestinal side effects appear to be pretty consistent and predominant among all three groups. I imagine the differences between Cagrisema and semaglutide results would probably lessen with a larger sample size, but that's not to say that GLP-1 agonist wasn't visibly outperformed by the amyl and GLP-1 combo. I would wonder, however, if the results would be different and how different would they be if metformin wasn't in the mix as well. Is there a subtle synergistic effect at play? It's less likely because these subjects enrolled were on a stable metformin regimen prior to starting the trial, but clinical trials can improve adherence to prescribed medications, so not an idea to completely abandon, but likely not something that we should worry alters credibility of the results. So yes, semaglutide has some competition. Well, not really, because Novo Nordisk is the company developing Cagrisema, and so it's less competition and more like there's enough to go around, or they'll have their metaphorical cake and eat it too. Direct head-to-head -head Cagrilantide versus semaglutide has shown no significant or statistical superiority, but in combination, these medications appear to be quite potent for weight loss, at least in smaller sample sizes. Larger sample sizes in overweight adults, perhaps in the absence of medications like metformin or alongside measurable lifestyle measures, will solidify the body of knowledge we have and allow us to gain a more statistical representation about how much body weight one would expect to lose, and a better idea of the side effect profile which to this point doesn't look too dissimilar from the GLP-1 agonists. And interestingly, Novo is in the midst of performing a series of trials evaluating Cagrisema as part of the REDEFINE program, a set of robust, long-term studies assessing the safety and efficacy of combined Cagrilantide and semaglutide use across different metabolic contexts and patient populations. Although full peer-reviewed publications aren't out yet, early data releases look optimistic and generally mirror results seen in smaller trials we mentioned earlier. Final data is expected to be presented at the American Diabetes Association's annual meeting in Chicago this June, and I'll be on the scene, metaphorically speaking, ready to report. Some of the earliest top-line results did make headlines because Novo's stock dropped significantly after their release, but in my opinion, that's less about clinical failure and just more about corporate overpromising. Novo had teased 25% plus weight loss, which was incredibly bullish, and while the actual results were still strong, they just weren't the dramatic differentiator big pharma investors were hoping for. So this may just position Cagrisama more as a competitor to terzepatide and ritatretide rather than a big leap beyond them. Apparently, losing 23% of your body weight now gets a meh from Wall Street. Like, imagine five years ago we told someone a weekly injection of a peptide could help them lose a quarter of their body weight. It would have sounded completely bizarre and suspended our understanding of reality. And now that pharmaceutical companies have essentially achieved that, anything less is, at least in the eyes of investors, a failure, which is logically absurd. But all that said, overall, it's an interesting compound, and I look forward to seeing where the research heads. Cagrelantide doesn't seem like it possesses a significant risk for hypoglycemia. But one interesting thing to keep an eye on with regards to amylin is the fact that this is the compound that's a key feature of amyloid plaques, distinct features of Alzheimer's dementia and other chronic high morbidity conditions characterized by what's called amyloidosis. While preclinical data has shown that native amylin and pramlintide can influence amyloid beta pathology in animal models, the clinical relevance of these findings for cagrelantide is 
unknown. Some studies suggest that amylin analogs may even have neuroprotective effects. So I would love to get a better preclinical assessment of these concerns to ascertain whether long-term use of an amylin analog would increase risk of neurocognitive disorders, among others, or perhaps, more optimistically, as the research is starting to paint, there's hope for the opposite. I will say there's nothing at this time suggesting amylin analogs would be accusatory towards Alzheimer's, for instance, but some overlapping pathways, as you can tell by now, concern me. And so I like to have concrete data to support human safety, and it seems we're on the way to that with these larger, more robust trials. The peptide's already got a good amount going for it, so I'm curious and excited to see where it heads. Thank you for watching. I've been meaning to make this video for some time. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're looking for further ways to support the channel, you can find the link to the Patreon in the description below. All user video requests are welcome. I just enjoy having peptide-based conversations, sharing research that fascinates me, and you get some free special drops as a member. On top of that, I do have a 20-page BPC-157 guide that's made available, as well as a retro-themed Peptide Codex online catalog all of which you'll find in the description below. But most importantly, I want to thank you for the time it took to watch this video. I appreciate your support as always. You have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.